This is me, Undead Viking, and this game right here is called Yokohama. Now, if you are a regular watcher of this video channel, then you well know that uh, I have currently uh, shuffled off the, the corporate tie and shirt, and I am now currently working within the game industry. And uh, I was lucky enough to go to the Tokyo Game Market uh, fairly recently, the last couple weeks, and I went there uh, with the company that I work for, uh, Tasty Minstrel Games, and one of the games uh, that I was able to check out and enjoy and play is this game right here. And uh, when I played this game uh, with Michael Mendez, the uh, the Grand High Puba of TMG, uh, both he and I said, this game is amazing. And so I knew at that moment that uh, Michael was going to look into the possibility of bringing this sucker over to the United States and getting it uh, more uh, distribution. And uh, very recently, uh, they were happy to announce, I should say we were happy to announce, that a contract has been signed and uh, TMG will be publishing uh, this game uh, in the United States. Uh, so uh, then, because I had a copy and I bought this at the Tokyo Game Market, I decided that I would go ahead and do this little video so I could kind of introduce uh, this amazing game uh, from the designer that uh, you probably have heard of. I'm, I'm guessing you've heard of the game of trains, uh, maybe Sail to India. Um, but anyway, uh, Hizashi Hayashi, I, I hope I'm saying that correctly, uh, was the designer of those games, fantastic games, and this is uh, one of his more recent uh, creations, and this is an amazing game. So um, I don't want to take too long because I want to kind of go in-depth into the game and kind of show you how the game is played. Um, you know, and I, I have to fully admit, yes, yes, this game is going to be published uh, by the company that I work for. Uh, but even if they hadn't uh, done it, I was going to do a video for this as well, just because I am so glad that I'm probably one of the very few people that actually have a copy of this currently uh, within the United States. And it's something that I've shown off at my local game store, I've shown it off to my gaming group and my Bizarro gaming group, and everybody has dug the heck out of it and all of them were like where can I get a copy and I said I have no idea and then now I can actually tell them you're gonna be able to get a copy because it's gonna be published over here but anyway regardless let me show you how to play uh, Yokohama and then we'll come back here and I'll give you my final thoughts uh, after that all right cool all right this is Yokohama and I know looking at this it probably just looks like a lot of busyness and it is the first time that I saw the game I was staring at the board and I was like uh, what is this how do I do this how, how, how do I play but I'm hopefully gonna show you the the mechanisms of the game and also just to give you a kind of idea of the flow and once you've played it this is definitely one of those games that after you've done like the first turn uh, you just get it I mean it, it just clicks it, it flows well and it works well all right so before I dive into the mechanisms, I want to take a little bit of time to talk about how the game is set up. Now, each one of these uh, placement tiles here is separate. You know, and it, you know this isn't a board that's connected. And before the game begins, uh, depending about, upon the number of players, um, you will set up the board using these tiles. Uh, with less players, you're going to have less tiles. I've just gone ahead and shown all of them because I just I wanted to show you the whole thing. So in a four-player game, you're going to use every single tile. So you do this randomly. Um, the back of these tiles is like a blank that everything looks the same and you will then just randomly distribute them in this kind of ziggurat pyramid structure. After you've gone ahead and set up all of that, and I'm going to explain what each one of these tiles does and what have you here in just a little bit, so just bear with me. After that, you are going to take these little cardboard tokens, and I'm going to explain what these do, but you're going to take these little cardboard tokens, notice how this one has some fish on it, and you're going to take those cardboard tokens, you're going to kind of shake them up in your hand, and you're going to place one on each one of these boards. And you are going to have some left over, so in some games you're going to have an abundance of certain uh, uh, like tokens that have certain resources or certain like money or these imported goods. Um, just And it will be different. I like that. And then this game does that with a lot of the things that um, you know, you're always going to uh, you can't count on certain things always being there and always being present. And I've always liked that in games. Um, then, 
these cards right here, um, these cards are for placed on each one of these boards. And this board is the only one that doesn't have it, and I'll explain what that little harbor board here is also in just a little bit. And you're going to place one of those on each of the, these placement tiles as well. And you can see right here I have some left over. These will not be used in this particular game. So, you have randomly set up each one of these tiles, you have randomly placed one of these tokens on each tile, and you've randomly placed one of those cards on each tile. After you've done that, there's one last, last thing that is random. You have these achievement cards, and you have A's, you have B's, and you have C's. You will choose one A, 1B and 1C, and the others will not be used. And these are achievements that, uh, if the players succeed in them, they'll gain bonus points. And the first person to succeed on them uh, would, will gain the, the points that are on the left-hand side, and then every player afterwards uh, will achieve the points that are on the right-hand side. So um, this would be, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead here, so just I apologize, but when I explain this to you, you're probably going to say, what? But then as I explain how the game is played, you'll say, oh, okay. So these are production tiles. You'll notice that there are some tiles that have this little hammer on them, and some tiles that have these little, uh, like a pen uh, tip. And so these are commercial and these are production. The reason you have that is that when you place, uh, when you manage to place a house, um, which once again, I'm jumping ahead of myself, so just bear with me. Um, that's what these tiles are. You're placing your shop houses on them. If you are the first person to have four shop houses on four production tiles, you gain the bonus points for this particular achievement. Um, you get 10. Everyone afterwards would get eight. Um, uh, here, like we have achievement cards in for the B. These are like if the first person to 10 coins. If you get 10 coins, uh, then you can show that you have 10. You don't spend them, but as soon as if you have a stockpile of 10 coins, you would gain nine points. Uh, the first person and the second person would gain seven. This particular uh, achievement tile referred to contracts, and that would be uh, you know nine and seven completed contracts. Uh, here would be if you had seven fish, eight and six, and so forth. So you're gonna pick one 1A, 1B, 1C, put the rest back in the, uh, the, the box, and then those will be the achievements uh, that you will be able to gain extra points for uh, in this particular session of the game of Yokohama. After you've gone ahead and set up these boards, um, you will also set up the boards that are down here. And these are different scoring, uh, like tracks here and here. Uh, these are for completed, like turning in imported goods. Uh, this is for uh, actions and completed actions taken on the church track, which are located here. Now, technically what the game says is, so you don't lose track of these things, is that you want to place these boards next to, or as close as possible to, uh, the placement tiles that are on the board. And that would work normally, but unfortunately I'm trying to show you this in a video, and so I couldn't really place those boards. They'd be hanging out over this way and that. And I have played like this as well, and so it does work. But for people that just want to be able to have the boards right next to the, the ones that uh, are represented by the workers and, then, and the placement tiles, uh, it can help a bit. Now these tiles over here, are for uh, the different technologies that you can increase. And so there is a technology A and a technology B. And there is a technology placement tile here, and, there, and that's A, and there's a technology uh, placement tile B. Those are called the laboratories that are on the game. And I, once again, I will explain how all these things work, just I wanna make sure you understand where these things are connected. Over here, these are orders. Uh, you'll be completing orders as the game uh, is played so you can earn victory points and other rewards. And once again, that is a A and a B. And so you can locate uh, the Port A, which you know, you, you get uh, your orders from that one right there, and you can locate uh, Port B uh, right there, kind of in the middle. And so, like when you place them randomly, you'd be running into a situation where it'd be kind of tough to put, you know, your your tile there. And so you just kind of have to kind of place it as close as possible. Or, like I've done, is I've just kind of set them down below, and then everybody can kind of uh, refer to them as the game is played. All right. So that is the complete setup. Um, these particular boards, you do stock them uh, with cards to begin with. And it's like a lot of other games that when you, you know, if you take, uh, 
a card, the other things slide down, you know, and, and because of the fact that, like, this is a low, medium, and high, and obviously it costs more resources or, you know, it costs more um, actions or, so to speak, or like the power of actions, uh, low, medium, and high to get those. And the same thing over here. You know, these are easier technologies to get and so forth as it increases. But once again, getting a little bit ahead of myself, so I just want to take a quick step back and I want to talk about the basic mechanism of uh, Yokohama. So the whole thing you want to do with Yokohama is you have your president pawn, which are these pawns right here. They don't start in the harbor, I just put them there just so you can see them. They start in the player's hands. And the idea is, is the president of your company, that represents you. And they will be going out into Yokohama and completing actions on the board where their assistants are located. And when they go there, they help those assistants complete actions on those places on the board so they can reap rewards that can later be turned into, you know, different, uh, like, complete orders for victory points or to get trade goods and so on and so forth. This whole purpose is you're trying to collect resources uh, that can be then used uh, for different methods, different, like, your, your economic engine, if you will, that will get you victory points so you can win the game. So, the way you do this is that I, I put all the little assistants in here, but like you, everybody starts uh, with you. You have a bunch of these, uh, but you don't start with all of them. You you start with eight assistants, and you're going to be placing those on the board on your turn during your placement phase. You can place up to three assistants on the board. And you do that by just picking a spot on the board. They don't have to be touching each other. You, you could put one here, you could put one there, you could put one there. Doesn't matter. You can just go ahead and place them wherever you like. And you can place up to three in three separate locations. You can, if you'd rather, put two on one spot. You can just do that if you like, and you can go ahead and just, you know, slap those down. And then, but you can't, that's all you get to do. If you're going to put two in the same spot, you have to do that like so. You can, if you wish, or because you have to, because you are running low on work on assistance, you can just put one down if you want. You can even, if, if you just, for whatever reason, don't want to, or you don't have any uh, present at the present time, just place none as well. The placement phase, that's what you're going to be doing. Now, you're going to want to try to put your, your assistants uh, close to each other if you're trying to be able to move your president on the board because your president can only travel to locations that have your assistants on them. So, you if you went like here, here, and here, and your assistant happened to be in this location, or, I'm sorry, your president, have, they could go like that, and they could end up in that spot over there. And then they could then go ahead and take the action that is presented to them by that fish market in that spot. A couple of things about placing your assistants. If you place your assistant in a location where somebody already has their own president, you have to pay them one coin to, be, have, the, to have the option of doing that, to place that assistant in that spot. If you have an existing spot, like where the system was already there, but then you have your president pass through a location that has a president, another, you have to pay them one coin for that process. I should mention that you cannot stop in the same spot as somebody else's president. If the president is there, you can't use it. Now, there are technologies and things that will alter up these rules. I'll talk about technologies in a little bit. A good rule of thumb with technologies are they're once again those cards that just kind of break the rules. They allow you to uh, do things that normally you would not have the option to do so. I should mention right now, just to get it out of the way, the harbor, you can see it has these arrows pointing in each of these directions. Anytime you travel through the harbor, it is free. You can't ever stop on the harbor, but you can travel through the harbor. You don't have to have an assistant in that location. That, as far as free goes, that is what I mean by that. But you do, as you can see, have to pay one coin to travel through the harbor to do that. So, now then, now what happens when you end up on a location where your assistants are located? Say, I have my three assistants in this location right there. If I ended up on that spot, I would then activate that production spot, and then I would total up the amount of power that my particular uh, president has when I'm taking this action. 
each uh, assistant and the president each count as one power. So in this case, it would be one, two, three, four. I would have a total of four power. You look at the board to determine what you would get. In this case, a four power would get me four fish. And so then I would be able to take four of these fish tokens and put them in front of me. And I'd have those resources available to me to complete orders or do other things with them as well. Two things about completing them with either a four or a five power. When you complete a four or a five power, you have the option, if you don't, to place a shop house or one of these bigger houses in your uh, this little card here and take the rewards that are located on that particular spot. Rewards, the big house has to go, I think it's called a trade house, has to go in the larger location there. You don't start with any of these, you do start with two shop houses. I'll explain the spot on the board where you're able to get more of these here in just a few moments. But if you place this like on this location, like here, that's one victory point. This location that has those two little houses going up allows you to take to either hiring assistants, meaning you take, because you have assistants in your like uh, your pool, your warehouse pool, that you'll be able to you know, add those to your available workers. Um, or, and you can do that, or you can use it to build more of these trade houses or shop houses if you want to. These trade house locations obviously have lots of victory points on them and that's where you place those and get those in that spot. Some of these uh, locations, like here, you just get more fish. If you took, put a shop house down on that location, you get three more fish to uh, add to your uh, resource pile. Um, some of them, like these little, like with like the four and everything, mean any uh, any resource you like. Just you can go ahead and pick any, any, any of the four different types of resources, which I should just mention offhand right now, are silk, uh, fish, uh, tea leaves, and copper over here. And you just be able to take one of those. Now I should mention that both silk and copper are tougher to come by. And what I mean by tougher to come by is that if you'll notice, like even with, even with one or two, you're gonna be able to get and activate that location and get some fish. Whereas in this location, you'll notice there's X's for the copper mine. So you'd have to have at least a power of three when you activate this spot to take that. Now, one other thing. If you happen to have a uh, either a trade house, and I should mention that you can only have one shop house per tile, but you can have a shop house and a trade house in the same tile. So if you happen to have a, a shop house or a trade house on there, that adds to your power as well. So in this, this example, you'd have one, two, three, four, and five. So you'd have a total of five power there. And then the neat thing there is that you could, once again, if you had uh, a, a trade house, you could, if, if you wanted, place a trade house in that location because four or five allows you to do that. But if you complete the five power on that person and, and this token is still there, meaning you're the first person to take the, the five power, you then get to collect this token, which will then give you this reward, which would, this would, is an imported goods tile, which would be right over here. More about the imported goods tile, once again, all together in the future. I'll explain that in just a second. But that is, like in a nutshell, that is the mechanism of this game. On your turn, you are going to be placing your your assistants in different locations on the board where, where you think you need them, and then you're going to be moving your president along the path and stopping wherever you like, and, and, and then taking the action on that board once you stop there. Now, there is no limit to the amount of movement spaces that you can go, and there's no limit to the number of assistants you can have on a certain tile. You're only limited by the number of assistants you have available to you. You could have like assistants going all the way around like this, and you could travel all the way around if you wanted. Now that you probably wouldn't because of the fact that you'd be kind of inefficient and you've put a lot of workers out in those locations. But there is no like you can only move three spaces type of situation. You get to move as far as you like as long as you have a continuous chain of these assistants. Just make sure you remember that if you place an assistant down on a spot that has a president, you have to pay them a coin. And if you travel through 
a location with somebody else's president, and you can't stop there, you have to pay them a coin for the, that possibility. All right, so the places that collect resources are very straightforward. Here you get tea leaves. Uh, here you get copper. Here you get fish. And over here, uh, you get silk. Of course, I can't see it. Silk, right there. You just, you're, if you're on that spot, you kind of put the, the amount of power, you check this particular, uh, uh, like, like, path here and see how many it. So, like, four power on the silk would get you three bales of silk. Very straightforward. Now, these are the spots that are slightly different. This location, the port, and this location, uh, also the port, of course I can't see it, <laughs> both here and here are the two ports. And when you land on those spots, depending upon the power, once again, we're going with the power in that location, you are going to be able to gain contracts, or contracts for these orders. Remember, they're over here, and this is for port A, this is for port B. Depending upon the power that you enact, you're able to purchase like a certain level of contract, either low, medium, or high. And so these are the low down here, the medium, and then the high. And you just go ahead and claim those, and, and, and you can take one for free. You'll notice right here, you can, for two coins, or trading in an imported good, you can gain two. The only thing with two is, remember that you, if you play, if the maximum is low, you can only take two low. If you had more power in that location, say you had a total of five, or four for that matter, if you did that and you took that action, you you could take a high, but then you could, if you want to take a high, you could take a high and a low, a high and a medium, too high. Just whatever power you take as far as the orders are concerned, you have to, like, that's the maximum level of the, the order that you can take. And as I said, if you take those orders, you then have to replace them from this deck here. At maximum, you can only have three unfinished orders at any one time. You can't discard them either, so be very careful with what you take because it's going to prevent you from taking orders until you complete those particular uh, uh, like resource requirements for that. So just for example, this particular order, and you'll notice that each of these have a flag up here. I will explain that once again, all together in the future. Just give me a second. So this particular order, as soon as you have three copper, one silk, and two fish, you would turn this in for one imported goods token, two coins, and for seven victory points. When you, com you, you, when you take an order, you put it face down in front of you. So you can kind of hide it from the players, but if players can kind of pay attention to see which ones you've taken. When you complete it, and you don't have to go anywhere on the board to complete it, you just say, I have the right, I have the right resources. You just turn in the resources to the, to, the, to the community pool, and then you just flip it over to show that you've completed it, and then take your rewards. That's as simple as that is. Um, and then, but, and then you've completed those, so if you have three orders, then you'd have the option of taking another one. Completing orders, if you happen to complete all three of your orders that you have on a given turn, you can turn all three in at once, at once. There's no, like, limit to the amount that you can do. So just, so, but most people, at least what I've been playing, is that you just complete them as you take them. And a lot of times people have, like, they think ahead and they say, okay, I'm going to get all these, like, resources needed. I'm going to get three copper. I'm going to get a tea leaf and I'm going to get a silk. And then you end up in this location and you take that and then you immediately turn it in as soon as you take the order. Very common thing to happen. So that is what the two ports do. All right. So moving to the technology. So we have the two laboratories. You have laboratory A and you have laboratory B. And that, that coincides with either of these locations. So in these spots, when you activate them, depending upon the power, once again, and these all remember, all these spots have act. It doesn't have to be a place you get resources to have um, your shop houses and trade houses. They, those can be on any of these locations. You total up the number of power, and that's the number of gears, the number of like 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 the level of the type of technology that you can take over here for those cards. But if you nuke, and it might be difficult, I apologize, but you can, if you want, for every two coins or an imported good, you can turn those in for an extra gear. Uh, and then, so you could then get a higher level of technology than the actual power uh, that you have in this particular location.
Now, before I show you how which which how this works and how much these cost, a couple of things. You can't just dump a bunch of workers on here to get like a power of 10. The maximum allowed is five. So just like everything else, it doesn't matter how many workers you have on a location, when you activate it and collect all of those workers, and you do collect all the workers on the location when you pull them off. So then they go back into your pool and they're ready for you to be able to distribute on the board after that. After you, you collect it, the maximum amount is going to be five. But like I said, you can, increase it using those coins and those trade goods. It should also be mentioned that the maximum number of uh, cards you can have, technology cards, is, is, is nothing. You could, you could have 10 technologies if you wanted, but uh, every fifth technology card after the first four, the fifth technology and everyone after that costs an extra two yen or one imported good token. Uh, so you, you do have like a limitation there. So you have to pay extra after the fourth technology card. So over here, there's all these technologies. And so like here, this is uh, this technology right here. Uh, you'll notice that there's nothing above this. Um, it was, so this would be, you have this number of three up here. And it just says, um, when you get copper, you get an extra copper. It's just a mining technology card, pretty straightforward. Uh, right here. Um, like also a fairly straightforward one. It says, this is just exposition, it costs five to get it. And then it's just 10 victory points if you get that. Now those are, those are simpler ones. However, there are ones that have a little bit more to them. So like here, the newspaper. So during the placement step, when you place a worker in a different areas, you can place four workers instead of three. So now instead of placing three in separate spots, you can place four workers with that particular one. And here, I'll show you this last one here. And there's tons of these technologies. I can't go through each and every card, but it is pretty cool. So here's the telegram. The telegram costs six. And place it, when you place two workers in the same area, you can additionally place one worker in an adjoining area. So once again, these are just ways that you can break the rules. Now you'll notice that above these, plus one, plus one, plus two, plus two, you add that to the total number of, of the, the technology level that you need to have to get that. So this one, if you wanted to get the telegram, it costs six, but it's in the plus two location. So you'd have to have a total of eight technology to get that. So if you were in this location and you had a power of five, you'd have to come up with a way to get three more, meaning you'd have to turn in either like six six coins to get that extra three or three imported goods or any combination of that to be able to take that particular technology. Now you will notice that these technology cards also have these little flags on them of these different nations. Like here's the American flag. So what does that mean? Okay, so this is a little bit of a wrinkle to the game. So for every multiple of two of any particular uh, nation that you get, you get to claim these tokens and these are called like like mercenary uh, ministers basically of these different uh, of, of these different nations and when you have these tokens what these allow you to do is on your turn and you can only do this once no matter how many of these mercenary tokens you have but once you use them uh, they're they're like a one-shot item if you happen to have like three tokens in a spot without your president you can go ahead and activate that spot at any point during your turn by using your foreign minister, your mercenary foreign minister, to activate it and use the power that's in that location. If you happen to have a, a trade house or a shop house in that spot, that would count as well. So in this case, if you used your foreign minister in that location, you get a power four and you'd gain four tea leaves in that particular location. If you happen to have enough power to do those things, you can use the extra extra power. You can claim that token with five. You can put a trade house or a shop house. Not a shop house in this situation because there's already one there, but you could put a trade house in that location by activating it. Now remember, you can only use one of those a turn. So if you have three ministers for whatever reason, you can't use all three. And you can, um, like, but you can do it at any point in your, in your turn. You could do it at the beginning, you could do it at the end, and so forth. Interesting to note that if you have if somebody else has a president in that location, Michael, you can still activate that location. You can go ahead and activate uh, those, those, those workers 
and you can get that. Now, normally you wouldn't be able to do that because your other president can't stop in the same spot as somebody. But then, and, and so somebody could try to block you from being able to do that, but if you have a minister, you'd still be able to activate that spot. All right, so you might be noticing you were saying, okay, what's up with this, uh, the customs and the church over here? Okay, so those two locations match up with here, customs, and they match up with the church here. And those locations, they activate just like anything else. You, the power on the location, your president or foreign minister, if they happen to not have a president, but you activate it. And with the church, you're going to go ahead and total up the total power and, and that is like the church power of this particular action. But, and then you can go ahead over here on this church board and you can use one of your workers that you have in your reserve that you have actually hired. You can't use one that you haven't hired yet. And you can go ahead and take the location and gain the rewards in this spot. In this case, this would be four victory points and it would allow you to place another worker anywhere on the board. Uh, uh, just choose a spot, you can place one down following the normal rules, of course. How do you get all the way up to 11 and so forth? Good question. You notice here that you have, if you turn in, basically, uh, like you have to turn in these different resources, you can notice that there is the copper, there's the tea, there's the fish, there's the silk, there's two coins, and there's an imported good, and it equals one power. Now what that means is, is that you can turn in one copper and get one power. You can turn in one silk and get one more power. You can turn in uh, a tea leaf and get one power. But you can only turn one in of each thing. So if you turned in an imported good, two coins, a silk, a fish, a copper, and a tea leaf, and had five on your activate, you could have a total of 11, which would allow you to claim this last location here, which would allow you to get the 14 victory points and the three, uh, the three workers being placed down. Once again, remember, you place the worker on those locations, and once they are taken, they are gone. It is, they're over and done with, and you can't, nobody else can take that particular spot. The customs office works exactly the same way, but you're going to be using your imported goods tokens that you've earned through a variety of means, mostly from completing orders, but also other ways as well, collecting these tokens and so forth. You turn in, a certain number of these particular imported goods, when you turn them in, the number that you turn in, is, the number you can turn in is determined by the power that you activate on this location, but also determines what you're able to do. So with four imported goods, you can get 22 victory points. For just one, you can get five victory points, but you get two um, like hiring actions and so forth. And so you can get coins and what have you and these victory points as well. So that's what the customs office does. Now the hiring actions is like here, this is the employment agency. When you go there and you activate that location, you get a certain number. So like with a three power, you'd get two of them. For that, you can hire two of your assistants that you haven't, that are still in your warehouse that you haven't been able to add to your pool yet. And that's free. You can, if you want, go ahead and get another uh, shop house. But that costs two coins if you want to do a shop house. And you can also do a trade house, but the first one costs four, next one five, next one six, next one seven. And so, you know, just that's the, the, their option. No, there isn't one, just, if you have two actions, you can get two trade houses, you can get two shop houses. There's no, like you can mix and match as well. But just, if you're gonna go with any of the houses, they, those do cost you money to do so. Uh, you have a bank location here, very straightforward. The number, you just, number of power you have there equals the amount of money that you can withdraw from the bank that you get. You like go work commerce and you can get points out of that location. And the final uh, location on the board is the trade house. And the trade house is you can do uh, the number of, the amount of power that you have in the location when you activate it determines the amount of trades that you can do. And the trades are pretty straightforward. Uh, you can get four coins for an imported good, but you can't buy an imported good for four coins. You can only trade them in for coins. But the rest of the things you can trade, you can trade in for copper, uh, tea leaves, silk, or fish. And so you, and you can trade back and forth. So you can, with like three trade, you could go there, you could sell five fish to get five coins, and then you could use those five coins uh, to buy two copper, with your next action, and then you can use the last coin that you got to buy a tea leaf in that location. And so then you can mix and match, buy and sell in that spot as you see fit. 
So those are all the different locations and how this game, uh, you know, in a, in, in a nutshell, uh, is played. Now, obviously, when everybody is moving their presidents around, you're going to be blocking different people. All those little assistants are going to be all over the location. You're going to be taking them up over here. And so there's a lot of more to it as far as, like, actually, you know, picking your location and choosing what you want to do. But I think you should have a pretty good idea of just how the game is played at this point. Now then... How does the game end? You know, there isn't like a, a turn order or a round structure or anything like that. How does the game end? Well, there's a lot of different uh, game end situations. The end of the game will be triggered if one or more players um, has built all of their trading houses. The end of the game is triggered if one or more players has built all of their shop houses. The end of the game will be triggered if... Uh, after you've replenished the order cards uh, in, on either of these order boards, this order deck is completely empty and there are blank spots on the orders, meaning that you can't, you can't refill the order boards in any way. That will trigger the end of the game as well. Uh, if the number of assistant pawns on the, either the church uh, board or uh, the customs board um, have, has reached the, the level that's needed uh, for the number of players. For two-player game, uh, four spots have been taken. For a three-player game, five spots have been taken. And for a four-player game, eight, six spots have been taken. Now, that's not six total on both these boards. There's got to be six locations taken on one of the boards, and that will trigger the end game. So, when the end game is triggered, whoever was the start player... Uh, will you, the person to their left, so if the, the start player is the one that triggered the end game, uh, everybody takes, finishes that turn. So it goes around the table and finishes the turn, and then everybody gets one more turn after the fact. So let's say the third player triggered the end game. So the third player finishes their turn, the fourth player takes a turn, and then everybody takes one more turn. So everybody has an equal number of turns. And that last turn is basically you trying to squeeze every single point you can out of your little uh, resource engine so you can go ahead and tabulate the, the final scoring. Uh, the final scoring, obviously, will be you've kept track of it on the scoring board, which, you know, I never even showed you guys the scoring board. Hold on a second. Here is uh, the scoring board. And then down here, you can see those are the three spots that you have for the different achievements that you can go for, per, uh, achievement A, B, and C down the bottom there. So you go ahead and you take the total points you scored as you've played the game, and then you're gonna go ahead and get bonus points. The first bonus points are gonna come from both the customs board and uh, the church bonus board. Whoever has the most number of assistance pawns on the church bonus board will gain six bonus points, and the second highest will gain three bonus points. On the customs board, the person who has the most uh, took, uh, assistance on this gains 8 points. The second highest receives 4. Technology bonus. Whoever has the most points as far as the levels of technology, remember the, like basically the cost and the gears that you had that you spent, you're going to get 10 victory points for that. And then the second highest will receive 5 victory points for technology. Finally, you will go ahead and you will uh, total up, you'll, you'll put together all of the different flags you have from your completed orders and from your technology. And for each completed set, there are five different nations, you will total up points. So if you have one of each, that would be worth 12. If you have uh, four of each, eight, three of each, four, and two of each, two. And now you, and you can like score more. So like, say for example, you have one of each of each uh, nation. So you have, you have a France, uh, you have a Spain, you have a um, uh, Great Britain, uh, America, and, and Germany. So you have all five. That would be worth 12. But then you had, say, a uh, United States, um, a Germany, and a Great Britain. That would be three, and that would be worth four points. And then you had like one more Great Britain, that would be worth zero. So you can score uh, more points if you have like, you know, you just take each uh, combined multiple that you have and gain those bonus points for that. Then finally, uh, for each unused uh, foreign mercenary uh, token, uh, you get one victory point. For every imported goods token that you did not use, you get one victory point. For every two money you have left over, you get a victory point. And for every uh, three trade goods tokens, any three, for any, any three trade goods tokens, you get one victory point as well. 
you total up the total amount of victory points, and just like any other game, whoever has the most points will then win the game. Well, hopefully you're still with me, and I remember at the very beginning you probably looked at this board and you said, holy cow, that's a lot of stuff that's going on there. Well, <laughs> I hopefully at this point you kind of have a really good idea of how the game is played, and you've kind of pulled yourself away uh, from, from the precipice, if you will. Yes, there is a whole lot that's going on with this game, and there is a whole lot going on, but... I love it. I love the interaction level. I, I love the fact that each turn kind of presents itself as a puzzle, and I really like uh, puzzle-solving games, and this is one of those games I consider it uh, to be in that genre. Um, I mean, I wouldn't really call it worker placement, uh, but I mean, it does have a, a little bit of Istanbul, uh, if, you, if you remember that game that uh, recent that was published a couple years ago uh, from Pegasus Spiel, uh, you know, with the, the placement of the different workers and being able to move about. But there's so much more, there's so much more depth, there's so much more complexity than that game, and I, I've really uh, taken a liking to this one just because of the fact that um, it has this, this random setup, it has the the, the the different goals that you have with achievements. You can't really count on any specific one. And like I said, each turn lends itself towards, you know, me trying to figure out how can I squeeze the most points out of this turn, but also it has one of those things where, well, how can I set myself up to like really cash in a turn or two from now? So um, for all those reasons and a ton more, which I'll go over in my final thoughts, uh, I'm really, really digging Yokohama. So let me talk about that, uh, as I said, in my final thoughts. All right, I'm not going to throw this box. I'm not going to do the box loop. I'm not, because this is mine. I, I bought this. I spent, I spent money. At, hold on. <laughs> okay, there you go. One. Uh, so Yokohama, there you go. Uh, you should have a really good idea of how the game is played. If you have any questions about the game, please post those. I will answer those. But... Regardless, let me just kind of dive into my final thoughts here and tell you what I think. Now, this game kind of goes a little bit against the innate nature that I am. I've said many, many of these conclusions if you've watched my videos or, or if you've uh, watched uh, my weekly show, the, the Weekly Alaboom. And if you don't, why not? Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Central Time. Anyway, um, that uh, I am an exploratory gamer. I love diving into games and I love exploring all the little nooks and crannies and then after like eight or nine plays um the games have given me all that i can use right i mean i there's no like real strategies or anything like that and then what the game turns into especially if like you have a game group like i do like we all play these games together we play them several times together uh the game just becomes a, a rote a repetition of our strategies as we just try to like maybe refine it you know and squeeze like an extra couple of two points here and there and just you know see if we can do better now there's a lot of people that really really love that type of gaming and i understand it i get it um there is a, uh, a gaming group in minneapolis st paul that i game with uh every year at kind of the north that they play those same games over and over again and and they and they really enjoy that and i get it and i understand why they get it but that's just not me however i've kind of explored this one i'm, I'm on like nine or ten plays now and i i've explored it you know and and they're really i i don't feel like there's anything left but i still want this to hit the table mostly because of the fact that well i'm undefeated but secondly <laughs> is that like each game, as I said, it, you know, during the gameplay, it's like a puzzle. Each each turn is like a new process of where am I going to place those assistants that I have? Where am I going to move my president? Where am I going to uh, uh, you know collect these resources? How am I going to get those three fish I need? How am I going to get that one last imported good that I need so I can get over to that spot and turn it in before everybody else does and get those bonus points? Now, I... I, I Remember right now that there is one thing that you can do if for whatever reason uh, you don't have like an option like you, you you like you just don't like where your president can possibly go you do have the option of taking it and taking it back into your hand now you don't get to do anything else that turn you don't get to go ahead and you know uh, activate any of the areas or do any of those things I mean you still get to place your assistance down but then you can just take it and you can put it in your hand and then the next turn, you can go ahead and place it down on the board wherever you happen to have an assistant. So you do have that option, but I very rarely has that option actually been exercised by anybody at the table. 
mostly because of the fact that it just like you feel like you're giving up <laughs> you know you, you like you're giving up that that possibility of being able to do something i mean even going and grabbing like you know three tea leaves when you don't really need them is still a good good idea i mean because of the fact that resources are unlimited you know, if you happen to run out of the counters for them, um, you you can just go ahead and, and just use something else for them. Or you can, like, you know, put, like, a coin underneath each one to kind of represent it. You, you can figure out a way. So, and, and those are going to be worth points at some point. Even if you don't turn them in for an order, they're worth points at the end of the game. So, you do have that option. So, I apologize that I didn't express that. But sometimes, and, like, I think the few times, one of the few times it's ever been used is when, like, somebody had been kind of boxed in. And they didn't have, they didn't want to spend their money by going through somebody else's president to go ahead and use that. But I mean, so very rarely will that occur, but it could. So I want to make sure you have that option and know that option exists. But as I was saying, it's like the exploratory portion of this is done for me. And, but I'm still wanting it to hit the table just because, and it's not even, I think, so I can squeeze those extra five points and see if I can do better than the last time I played. But for me, it's more of, I want to see like the new creation. I want to see the new board. I want to see how where those those spots are in it. And, you know, when I set this up randomly, I actually got the harbor in the middle, just like you have when you saw the plate. And that doesn't happen very often. You know, sometimes like the harbor is in like that kind of weird perfect spot where it, it has a lot of interchange going through back and forth. But you know, just but sometimes it's on the edge and it's just like and it just doesn't get happen. And so like it it's in the rest of the board kind of gets gummed up if you will with everybody's workers um you know so i mean it's just uh, what technologies are going to show up in this particular game what orders are going to show up what are the achievements and so all of those things combine into this kind of salad of of the whatever flavor the game is going to be in that particular turn and it's one of those games that i know that like you know i mean there's there's lots of euros there's lots of games out there strategy games out there that um once you've played them eight times, you, you're done. I mean, it's just that you got to hope for an expansion or whatever. But this is a game that isn't going to lose its staleness for me. It, it's it's going to be one of those games that I know it's going to be a challenge every time I take it out and play it. I know it's going to be highly competitive. And it's got just the right amount of tending my own garden and also the interaction. Like, you know, putting your putting your, your president in, like, the, the perfect spot. Um, you know, and, and, you know, just blocking, not, not so much blocking, but, you know, making sure people have to give you those coins to use it. You know, so there's just those cool things. And I just thought of another rule. I can't believe I forgot. Very, very small rule. Um, when you, uh, go to a spot and you activate a spot that has somebody else's, uh, uh like, uh, shop house on it, they get a coin from the bank. You don't have to pay them. But they just get a coin because they've 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 established themselves in that area, and so that because the extra commerce that goes through the area, they get paid. You don't get it on your own. You can't go and activate it and get a coin yourself. But like if somebody else is there, you get it. I just I, yeah I, I just you know and and there aren't and I I know that sounds like there's all these little tiny rules going on in the game, but there really aren't that many. I mean there's like you know that that's like the only little, like little tiny rule. Like obviously I just kind of blanked it right there. I just rem remembered it offhand. But regardless. Yokohama is that perfect kind of medium, almost medium heavy level Euro uh, that I can play in about an hour, hour and a half, especially if everybody knows. And like I said, it's a game that like, it's the very first time you play it, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna be able to figure this out. But after the first turn, you're like, oh, okay, duck, duck, duck. I'm gonna place those down, I'm gonna move over here and I'm gonna take that. And it's a game that rewards forward thinking. It's a game that rewards um, like strategic, placement and strategic uh like um prioritizing and it's a game that like just hits on all those different levels for me that i that i really really enjoy um i like games that make me feel smart <laughs> and this is one of those games where when you realize you kind of like you see how the board shakes out you see the path that shakes out you see that if you put two workers there i can move over there I can claim that, I can get those four tea leaves, I can turn in this contract that I have that is going to give me that trade good that I have. So next turn I can go over and I can go ahead and you know head over to the customs agent and I can turn in my four imported goods and I can cash in for like a big giant, you know, payday as far as victory points go. And when you have those turns that kind of combine together and, and you're able to pull that off, it's like that moment like that, ah, I'm brilliant. And and I like games that make me feel like that and allow me to be competitive with my friends and I don't feel like we're all just kind of doing our little solitaire thing. 
and and watching everybody else and and just racing to see what kind of score we can get and so there you go that is uh yokohama um as i said if you have any questions at all i'll uh, post away i'll happy to answer those to the best of my ability um as always i really appreciate you taking the time to watch this video and until next time uh this is me the undead viking and i'm telling you to have yourself one heck of an awesome day all right bye, -bye.